Okay. Uh, thanks everybody for, for making it out. Uh, and sorry about the email coming late uh, this week. It somehow I must have shut my laptop too quickly after I hit send and it, it didn't make it out of my draft. So I apologize for that. Um, but this week uh, we have Ryan Martin from Iowa State University who's going to be talking to us about splits with forbidden subgraphs. Uh, go ahead and take us away. All right, thank you, Drew. Um, so this is joint work with Maria Aksinovich. And if you can see, this is a coffee cup I got from Karlsruhe. I spent the fall, uh, last fall in Budapest at the Rennie Institute on sabbatical. And then I spent two months of the spring before COVID hit in uh, Karlsruhe working with Maria. And uh, so um, our subject is uh, splits, which I will explain. Um, so a graph um, is called an NK graph. It's also called a K split of the complete graph. It, if it has three properties, first of all, it's N partite. One of the things I wanna emphasize is that N is no longer the number of vertices in our graph but it's um, the number of parts in this split. There are at most K vertices in each blob. I'll use the word blob just because it's easier and, and more clear than using part. And at least one edge is between each distinct pairs of blobs. And for our particular problem, we might as well assume that exactly one edge is between each distinct pair uh, of blobs. So, so for instance, there is an edge between here and here, and it's this edge. And if you look between every pair, there's exactly one. So uh, there's a little bit of history to this, this sort of thing. Um, so Hayward, cons Hayward considered the smallest K for which some graph has a K split that is planar. So here gamma is taking the place of Kn in what we're doing. And so what we do is we take a graph and then we split it, but we make sure that the parts that um, parts have an edge between them in correspondence with the vertices of this graph gamma. And that's called the planar split thickness. And splits were used in bar visibility representations of graphs. Um, Hutchinson West and, and my co-author Maria, among others, have done things in this area. So what we were asking is uh, sort of a standard Turan type question. So suppose you're given a graph H and an integer N, which is larger than the number of vertices of H. What's the smallest K so that there's an NK graph with no copy of H as a subgraph? So you have this graph, H, which is forbidden. And what you want to do is create this other graph with blobs so that there's at least one edge between each blob. And since this is as a subgraph, I'm free to delete uh, any edges that are extraneous. If I, for instance, were to have two edges between blobs, I could just delete one of them and it, it wouldn't matter. Uh, and in fact, it would help me. So I want the minimum K so that there exists an NK graph G such that H is not a subgraph. All right, so with that set up in mind, um, take a look at this particular example that I've been feeding you for the past couple of slides. So it turns out it's bipartite. Instead of drawing it to be bipartite, what I'm going to do is I'm going to color the vertices and I'm going to color one red and one blue. And um, notice if you look carefully through each of them, every edge has a blue end vertex and a red end vertex, and that's exactly a bipartite graph. So this one's bipartite. Well, this isn't a coincidence. So uh, Barbanera and Euchert um, made an observation in, a, in another paper sort of introducing this idea that um, if the chromatic number of this graph H is at least three, then the F we wanna look at is equal to two. So all we need is, um, so all we need is a bipartite graph that is a split of Kn and that's easy enough to create. Um, so it turns out that this question 
is highly trivial for any graph H that is not bipartite. But like the Turan question, it suddenly becomes highly non-trivial when you are bipartite, when H is bipartite. Sorry, Ryan? Yeah. What's, what's, so what's going on with that result? Why, I'm just having trouble seeing why that should be true. Okay, so what you need to do is to take a uh, graph on two n vertices, and it needs to be, you need to have an edge between each of the n blobs, and it needs to be bipartite. So what you do, how do you construct this thing, is you take, um, you take the sets, say n sets, take n sets, um, color one of them, in each one of them, color one vertex red and one vertex blue. And then just arbitrarily put an edge between them such that it goes between red and blue. Doesn't matter how you do it. Then do it again for every pair of blobs. So for every pair of blobs, you're going to get an edge between a red and a blue. And again, arbitrary, it doesn't matter at all. And then when you do that, you're going to have an N2 graph. You have two vertices in each blob, you have N blobs, and you have, all the edges will go from a red to a blue. But that graph is bipartite, so there's no copy of H if H has chromatic number three or greater. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's but uh, th this is a good exercise because I think it gets, gets you thinking about how this, how this thing might work. Um, but it doesn't say anything about bipartite H's. Okay, so let's observe what we have. Um, and there's actually a very trivial lower bound here. Um, so an NK graph is a graph on at most NK vertices. We don't, we don't care if one of the blobs is a little smaller, but we, our parameter is always the largest blob. And since G is a graph that has no H and has NK vertices, then it obeys this rule. Okay, so again, G has N blobs, and so there are N choose two edges, one edge between each pair of blobs, and then we have the extremal number magically sitting there. But keep in mind, the extremal number is the total number of vertices. All right, so of course, if you replace this extremal with some expression that we happen to know for the extremal, for instance, if the extremal is less than C times L to the B, where B is some exponent, and it doesn't matter if you don't know the exact term exponent, it just has to obey less than or equal to C L to the B, then if you solve this equation for, uh, for K, you get, um, you get a K that's at least C prime N over N to the two over B minus one. Okay, so, so we've got a lower bound on the minimum here. Um, If, you, if K were to be any smaller, then it wouldn't obey this condition. Okay. And um, there is a, another observation here that um, H is always a subgraph of some complete bipartite graph. And so therefore we can use kavari turan to say that in fact, there is a B less than two for which this holds, and therefore um, we have this expression for FNH. So we got a lower bound, assuming some knowledge of the extremal function, and by kovari shosh um, we that holds, at least for some constant B, we're not really sure what the B ought to, what the B ought to be. But in any case, it's true, and so um, we got we have this condition, and among other things, this means f of n goes to f goes to infinity as n goes to infinity, which of course was not true when h was not bipartite. 
So that's an interesting little fact. And in general, I, I would say this is our main theorem that says that um, if you have a bipartite graph that's not a forest, and such a, for any sufficiently large L, the extremal function is trapped between these things with these exponents A and B for some positive constants C and C, capital C and exponents A and B. If B minus A is not too large, then in fact, we have these very nice bounds for F. Um, it's an artifact of the proof that we need A and B to be close to each other. Um, I wouldn't, I, I really don't know what the, um, what people conjecture as to whether the extremal function actually behaves like this or oscillates in some way. Um, I'll give you some information about that later. But notice that if A equals B, we get a really nice tight result that only differs by a multiplicative log term. So, um, so that's nice. And, and let me go through what some of the things that we know, some of the things that we know about turn on exponents. So I got this from the Ferdi Shimanovich paper and the Ball and Pepe paper and a Janzer paper. And um, I, I just wanted to show that there were some examples for which um, our theorem holds and some for which our theorem doesn't hold. Uh, and just for an example, uh, C2K, if K is in uh, two, three, and five. So C4, C6, C10 doesn't work. The upper and lower bounds are too far away from each other according to our formula. Um, but um, C4, uh, C6, and C10 do work for, um, for our theorem. Uh, so does K2T, K3T, I have K5T, I'm not sure why I don't have K4T, but um, K4T I think uh, follows from K5T. K6T works. Um, but the bounds that we know of so far for KST, where S and where T is not too much bigger than S, uh, don't work. But then they work again if uh, T is much larger compared to S. And of course, better values are known when T is huge compared to S. But um, but our theorem still holds there. For the cube, uh, it doesn't hold. Um, because the bounds we have on the cube are just too far apart. And um, this, this expression, this uh, KKST, um, this is a um, relatively new result. This is from the Janser paper. And this is um, subdividing KST um, in a certain way. But it happens to work in that case too. Okay, so sometimes our theorem works, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, it does work if you actually know the Turan exponent. So the obvious corollary is if you have a bipartite graph that's not a forest so that um, the extremal value is theta of L to the R, then there are constants for which F of NH is trapped between N to the 2 over R minus 1 and N to the 2 over R minus 1 times a log term. So um, again, our, our theorem works on a larger range for which the Turan exponents are known, but this is a talk. I want to simplify the talk. So we'll just assume that the Turan exponent exists, and so we're, we happen to be in the situation of the corollary that, um, that the exponent exists. And then I'll try to explain uh, you know, how some of this goes. So there's a very important lemma that we use. Um, it's an old lemma due to Erdős and Shimonovich. And it says if the extremal function, at least the way we're using it, if the extremal function uh, has a known exponent, then what we can do is we can find a graph that's not quite extremal. It has half the edges of the extremal graph. But the maximum and average degrees differ by at most a multiplicative constant. So there's no a priori reason that, um, that the extremal graph um, for any Turan property doesn't have one very large degree vertex and then, um, and then 
a um, bunch of moderate degree vertices. But you can do a little bit of manipulation of, of an extremal graph that you don't know much about, but to guarantee that the maximum degree is not too big. And so once we have that, what we're going to do is, uh, the, the upper bound is really the key. The lower bound follows directly from the first observation that I made that the extremal function, you had n choose two less than or equal to the extremal function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose a, um, I'm going to choose a k value such that this equation is um, followed. So so ex nk is greater than or equal to 12 n squared log n. 12 doesn't matter. Um, notice, of course, that we know that this is true, that if you have n squared over 2, that's automatically true for, uh, for uh, if we have an nk graph. But we, um, here we're going to, um, we're going to let our k be large enough, and then we're going to find a graph. What, what graph are we going to find? It has nk vertices, which we label capital N. We have um, the extremal number divided by two edges, where um, we'll just say that that's capital M. And then the maximum degree is some constant times m over n. So 2m over n is the um, 2m over n is the average degree. So we're just going to let q be constant, and that puts us um, and we can guarantee all that from the Erdős-Szymanovich result from 1970. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take such a graph. We haven't created the blobs yet, so let's create the blobs. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to randomly partition the vertex set into blobs. And not only that, we're going to do it in the most naive way possible. We're going to color each vertex with one of the n colors independently and with probability one of n. So it seems like an obvious thing to do. And we need to show two things in order for this to be, for this construction to be an nk graph as, as we would like it. The first thing is that each blob has to have reasonable size. Um, the size we're looking for, of course, is k, but uh, we allow ourselves a little wiggle room. And if we allow ourselves a little wiggle room, it's very easy to show that if you um, partition a set randomly in this way, the uh, largest size is k plus little o of k. But the other thing that's more difficult is that we have to guarantee this condition where uh, every pair of edge, every pair of blobs has at least one edge between them. And again, in this case, if we have multiple edges, that's great. We could delete them if we felt like it, but otherwise, um, we don't bother much. Okay. And the problem with this is there is a slight dependency, um, depending on what you think your um, random events are, but. I would say the event is that two blobs have an edge between them. Well, there's a, there's a dependency on that because the, the blobs are determined by uh, coloring the vertices. All right, so, so what we're gonna do is we're going to get around independence. And here's how we'll do it. So we're gonna let i and j be colors. And we're going to let Sij be the number of edges with color i on one end of vertex and color j on the other. i is going to be not equal to j. If i equals j, it's fine, but we don't care. And what we're concerned about is the event that Sij is equal to zero. If any of those events happen, it's a bad situation. So we want to show that the probability of that is uh, strictly less than one. I mean, formally, we want to show that it's less than half because we still need that condition that all of the blobs are of size at most k. But that, again, that happens uh, with very, very high probability. So we don't worry about that. OK, so by symmetry, it suffices to bound just this expression the probability that the uh, blob colors one and two um, have no edge between them. 
because then all we are, all we're, we're going to do is if we can bound this expression, then we can take the union bound to bound this probability. And if this is small enough, then the union bound will, uh, will solve our problem for us. So we've sort of reduced the problem, we hope, we, and we really have reduced the problem to just taking two blobs and saying, is there an edge between those two blobs? And the way we're going to do this is, um, and maybe it's natural, maybe it's not, um, is we're going to take an edge from this graph that we have. The graph is deterministic. We, we don't have much control over the graph. But what we are doing is randomly choosing the vertices. So for every edge, we're going to denote the indicator of the event that the color of the end vertices of EI are 1 and 2. So what is the probability of II complement? What's, so I'm, I'm asking, hoping to get a little feedback here. So we have, we have an edge and we need to know what the probability is that um, we don't have the event that the colors are one and two. Well, the probability that a vertex has color one is one over n. Probability that a vertex has color two is one over n. And so what we're looking at is one minus two over n squared. So the edge can have colors one and two or two and one. And then we, we want to consider the complement of that event. So that's one minus. And so what, what S12 is, is that's just the event of all of these things failing to happen. And then there's, if, if all of these events, or if all the I's fail to happen, or in other words, if the, so this, this means that, the, that a given edge does not get colors one and two. If no edge gets colors one and two, then we have a bad situation. And that, that would mean that this is true. What we would like to say is that the probability of intersection of events is approximately the product of the probabilities. If, that, if they were equal, they would be independent. But as I said, there's a slight dependence here. We can't guarantee that there's independence of these events. And the problem with um, what I would consider a traditional approach to attacking this problem is there's really too much dependency to apply the Lovas local lemma. So the Lovas local lemma, when you apply it, there's, you have to have a certain amount of no dependency. If things are too far away from each other in some sense, then there's no dependency. But there's, there's a slight dependency everywhere here. But the thing is, it's not very big. The dependency is not very much. So Lovas local lemma doesn't seem to work very well, but there is an alternative, and that's uh, Swen's inequality. Um, perhaps I should say Swen's inequalities. Uh, Swen had a version of this, and, um, and it was subsequently improved. So Swen, the setup for Swen is remarkably similar to the setup for the local lemma. So uh, Swen's inequality has a super dependency digraph. And I'm going to simplify things um, for our setting. So here's your goal. You want to show that these events are independent. So you just say what, what our goal is, is the product of the probability of ii, of the complement of ii. So that's, we want to say that the probability of what we're looking for is very close to the probability that we want it to be. And Swen says, well, that probability minus that is less than or equal to m times this expression. So the expression that I'm coloring in yellow here, if you think about this, if the sum of those y's is small, then you have e to the small minus 1, which is small. And so 
what we hope to get is that basically the probability that we're looking for is m plus m times small. And then that will allow us to solve the problem. Um, what happens to, uh, to Swen's inequality is it has this expression to it. And since the events i, i, and i, j are sort of well understood, we're just coloring things uniformly at random. This is not a bad setup to use. But we didn't use it. <laughs> and, and mostly, well, let me go into to what this means um, you know, for what we're doing. So, so M is um, the product of these probabilities, which is less than or equal to E to the negative of the sum of the probabilities, which is E to the minus mu. So it's E to the minus mu. And so what Swen's inequality, if we get things to work, it should say this, that this probability is roughly E to the minus mu. And um, unfortunately, it's too restrictive for us. So what we're going to use is um, Janssen's version of Swen's inequality. So if you find yourself um, facing a situation where you think that Lovas' local lemma is not working, there's too much dependency, at least between events, but the actual dependency between events isn't very big. Um, maybe you want to use Swen. I'd, uh, I'd recommend Janssen's paper in 1998. Um, because not only does he publish Swen's inequality, he publishes a number of versions of them. And the one we use is basically the one with the fewest amount of variables. Um, so there's, there's an extra parameter that applies in all of his other theorems, but in this one, um, you, it's eliminated. And um, we pay a little price. Um, we don't get quite what we want, but um, it's not a big price for the problem that we're interested in. So here's the setup of Janssen. So we have a bunch of indicator random variables and we have a dependency graph. If A and B are disjoint and there's no edge in A, B, then the sets I, I and I for I and I and I and B are independent. S12, which is what we're looking for, it's the thing we want to compute. Um, we want to determine whether it's zero or not. Well, that's the sum of the indicators. And that's just the number of edges that are colored with color one and two. Um, PI is just the expectation of the indicator as usual. And mu is the expectation of this thing. And that's the sum of the PIs. D, I, I don't know, I, you might call it a discriminant. It's, um, it's a covariance. And what it's doing is it's measuring the covariance of these things. And so you take your dependency digraph, you um, look at the dependent pairs, and then you compute this expectation. And you sum over all i's. Divided by two doesn't matter. And the conclusion it gives you is the probability of what we're looking for, the probability that the sum of these indicators is zero is small, and in particular, it's minus the min of mu squared over 48d or mu over four. So what we would have liked is this to be exp of minus mu. But as you can see, we, we suffer a little bit. We don't get, we don't get mu even in this case, we, we get mu over four. But that won't matter for us because we end up with a log term anyway. And so we don't need this. So let's go uh, into our setting. So our setting is, well, the PI is the event uh, that an edge gets colored with colors one and two, and that's two over n squared. Uh, we add those up, and that's just two over n squared times the number of edges. And uh, then if we look at this, so when are two events dependent? Well, um, we're measuring, we're determining whether and one edge has color one and two, and another edge has color one and two. If those edges are vertex disjoint, then they're not dependent on each other because they coloring these two vertices and these two vertices are different. But if they share a vertex, then there is some dependency. 
and so what I want to say here is that this, this is um, an expression in terms of the graph. And this expression is in terms of the the blue, the thing underlined in blue is in the dependency digraph. So in the dependency digraph, we're interested if, and in this case, it's not a digraph, it's it, the dependency digraph is just an ordinary graph. So if we have two events that um, intersect with each other, that corresponds to two edges sharing the same vertex. And so that's why we have a sum of degree choose two. And then the probability that um, two edges are both one, two edges, colored with one and two, means that the central vertex gets a color either one or two, and the other end vertices get the other color. So that's two over n cubed right here. And then that's easy to compute. It's easy to compute an upper bound for um, because the capital delta is just the maximum degree of the graph, and remember that um, we needed that from the Erdős-Szymanovich theorem. So, um, in fact, we could probably prove this without that uh, theorem, but um, giving away, instead of having the extremal number of edges, having the extremal divided by two doesn't, we don't get a substantively better result anyway, so it didn't matter to us. And if we just plug it in, literally plug it into Janssen's formula, we get uh, this expression. So um, mu over four is m over two n squared. And this complicated mu squared expression simplifies to this. And we can further simplify the expression down at the bottom, the n over uh, 12 q squared n. Um, because uh, that's just the way it simplifies. And if we plug in our value, so let me go back here a second. So we have n over uh, 12 q squared n compared to m over uh, 2 n squared. Um, if we plug in m, which is the extremal number for m, um, what we get is that this term m over 2n squared dominates. And so we get um, this expression. Now it turns out that if, if we chose a k that was large enough, then the exponent is at most minus 3 log n. And then the union bound holds the probability that um, there exists a bad vertex is less than or equal to n choose two that there exists a one two vertex or a one two edge. So if there exists, if there is no edge between points between two blobs, then that means that this is at most n choose two times the probability that some blob doesn't contain an edge. And then that, that's less than or equal to e to the two log n minus three log n, which goes to zero, which ends the proof. So the the story here is that Janssen, Janssen's version of Swen um, is really important for what we're doing. We, again, we have some, um, some dependency digraph, but it turns out that there is some dependency between the events, but fortunately it's small enough for us to handle. All right, so, um, so we get this log term. Uh, in the upper bound. So if you remember, we have um, we have F N H is at most um, big O of um, what is it? N to the uh, two over R minus one. Well, let me let me just point you to uh, to this expression. So that means if k is too large, then, then it doesn't work. Then, then we get a coloring. So k has to be bounded by that expression in orange. The log term, as with most probabilistic methods, is inevitable. Um, we, we are always going to have a log to always. 
almost always have a log term when you apply the a probabilistic method like this. So we were pleased um, that we didn't think with um, with a probabilistic method we could do any better. And I think that's borne out in some of our other results where we can get rid of the log. And in particular, we can get rid of the log for C4. So in general, if, um, if the extremal number is doing what we wanted to do, then we get, um, we get a log term difference in the upper and lower bounds. But for C4, we don't get a log term. We get um, a two, a coefficient of two between the upper and lower bounds. And the reason why is because we don't use a probabilistic method. So the lower bound comes from this typical way we keep getting lower bounds. We know that we have to have n shoes in the graph that we get, we have to have n shoes two edges. And that's bounded by the extremal number, which we know for C4. So that's the lower bound. And the upper bound comes from uh, a construction of a q to the 3 halves, 2q to the 1 half graph that is C4 free, where q is the square of any prime power. So technically speaking, we have an infinite sequence of examples that produces the upper bound. Um, but what you can do is between examples, you can just delete some vertices and, and you can interpolate between those. So we do need uh, Q to be the square of a prime power, or in other words, a prime to an even power. And here's the way we do it and how we do our construction. So for any prime power P, the classical affine plane of order Q has Q squared points and Q squared plus Q lines. And what you do is you just take a projective plane of order Q and delete a line. And what you get is the classical affine plane. So what you're seeing here is a projective plane of order three. Um, remember the Fano plane, or recall the Fano plane, is a projective plane of order two. So projective plane of order three, you can think of as a hypergraph, where the sizes of the edges are four. And so what you do is you take this thing, and you can check that it's a projective plane of order three if you, if you want to. Um, but if I delete that one edge, this is what I get. And, and this is really nice now. I have uh, a three by three grid of vertices. Um, and I also have these, notice that the edges sort of come in packs. I have the horizontal edges, I have the vertical edges. I have the edges with slope one. And then, so, yeah, the, the way this is drawn is a little confusing, but uh, this has slope one, this has slope one, and th let's see. Oh, sorry, I, I misdrew it. This has slope one going all the way here. This diagonal has slope one, and then this triple has slope one. And then we have slope negative one. So they all come together in bundles, um, all with the same slope, and here I've colorfully drawn them. So the graph um, that we're going to create GQ is bipartite. It's uh, points and lines. Um, so this should be very familiar to anybody who's, who's seen the projective bipartite graph of the projective plane with points and lines. This is just the affine plane. And so we have our points and we have our lines. And a point is adjacent to a line in the bipartite graph if and only if the point is in the line in the, um, in the affine plane. Um, I should point out that what this does is if you take the projective plane bipartite graph and you delete a line and you delete the corresponding points, this is what you, this is the graph that you obtain. But we can, if you're given the affine plane, sometimes easier to express it this way. And I will 
I will take advantage of the fact that we are expressing it in terms strictly of the affine plane. And the claim is that uh, this graph has no C4. Now that claim is easy if you believe what I told you that it was the projective plane construction where you delete a line and all the incident uh, points. All right, so um, so what I want to do here is, yeah, I'm, I think I'm here, I'm establishing C4 free. So um, if we let H be a subgroup of order, square root of Q of the additive group, um, and uh, uh, additive group of this field, and let A be the set of distinct representatives of cosets, um, then what we're going to do is we'll have this point, uh, the set of points, uh, P, X, and H. So again, the, the points are um, X, Y's. Remember, our, our uh, points were in a nice grid. And so P, X, and H are all of the X's which are um, for which the y is a different coset, uh, or sorry, is a different, um, we take the representatives of the cosets and we take an element of the coset. And we take all the y's that fit into this uh, category and we bundle them together as points. And the lines are just uh, lines of that are bundled according to the slope. And it turns out that each uh, subset of points and each subset of lines has size square root of Q. And what we're going to do is pair each set of points with a set of lines to make uh, a blob of size two square root of Q. So if you're picturing this as a bipartite graph, you have your points and maybe you have your lines, and you have some bipartite graph in between, and then you further um, subdivided the points, and you further subdivided the lines, then you're gonna just arbitrarily um, pair up a point with a line, uh, set of points with a set of lines. Does it make much sense? Well, it, it turns out it solves a, a minor problem here, but, um, but you can do it arbitrarily without much trouble. So now that we have, we have a C4 free graph, and then we've done this partition of the, of the affine plane of the points and the lines, and then I have two claims here. One is that the graph is actually a graph with the blobs that we want, so it's a Q cubed, two square root of Q graph. And that's, that's sort of clear that that's, um, the, the blobs are of size exactly two square root of Q and therefore there are Q cubed um, blobs, I guess, right? And then GQ has an edge between each pair of blobs. And um, I, I won't get into why that's true, but that's, um, it's basically the picture is showing you. Um, what, what we've done actually is we've, the, it turns out that the blobs that we're taking for the, oops, the blobs that we're taking for the points are just the vertical lines. So we take the vertical lines and that's gonna be how we're gonna bundle the points together. And that's the, um, that's the P-axis. Okay. And then the LMs are going to be those with the same slope. And then we do the further subdivision according to this uh, coset, the cosets and the subgroups. And, um, you know, I, I, it looks very complicated, I think, because of the notation, but the idea is, is pretty simple. And uh, in fact, um, Craig Timmons, uh, after we posted this on Archive, made the observation that you can get this similar upper bound result for uh, C6 
NC10. Um, the constant here, you pay a little bit, but that doesn't matter. You, you get rid of the log term for C6 and C10. And that's just because we know constructions of uh, C6 free and C10 free graphs, and they're very well defined and they're very algebraic, so we're able to understand those very well. Um, a corollary for this, what's interesting is that for our problem, if you get something to be true for H, you get it to be true for every super graph of H. And so in particular, our result on C4 uh, corresponds to a result on K2T. So uh, the upper bound still holds. The lower bound, we keep losing ground, um, but we only lose a constant. All right, so, so we're able to, um, we have a log term difference if we know the Turan exponent. If it's, um, if it's a C4 or a C6 or a C10, we know enough about the extremal graph that we can get a better result and get rid of the log. And then we have a um, question about trees. So if you remember I, in, way back in the, um, when I said what the main theorem was, we excluded trees explicitly. And we have better results on trees. On trees, we have no log term. So if a tree is on T edges, then we have the following bounds. Um, the results are pretty straightforward. The lower bound is the same old lower bound we've always done. The upper bound comes from multicolor Ramsey. And that, me, and that comes from here. And it turns out that the multicolor Ramsey number for trees is nice, and we can analyze that. And if you notice, our general bounds on trees differ by a multiplicative factor of four. Moreover, um, they depend highly on the fact that we know the extremal number is at most LT minus one. But the Erdős conjecture suggests that, in fact, you can do better and that the extremal number is less than or equal to L times T minus one over two. And if that were true, then we would improve the lower bound by a factor of two and we could get rid of that. Um, I think the Erdős-Shosh conjecture, there, there's currently a claim that a proof exists and that claim is at least five years old, um, and probably even older than that. So it's apparently a very complicated proof. So if you believe the Erdős-Shosh conjecture is true, then, then we can get a slightly better bound. But in the special case of a star, we actually have the solution in almost all cases. So um, we have that it's actually um, n minus one over t minus one. And I made a slight mistake here. Uh, let me fix it. Uh, the slight mistake is this is the ceiling of n minus one over t minus one. Unless t is even, and n minus one over t minus one is an even integer. And in that case, we were not able to, uh, to fix it. We, we had a difference of one. Um, we, uh, I, I should say we, we were able to, uh, if, if t equals two, um, notice that that's even. So t equals two means that you forbid um, a k12. So forbidding a k12 is forbidding this graph as a subgraph. But all that means is that the maximum degree is one. But you can do a perfect matching and the perfect matching has exactly uh, um, n minus one blob, uh, blobs of size n minus one. Take a perfect matching. Um, perfect matching with n times n minus one edges. And then just two color the edges the edges differently. So for every edge color one vertex one color, color i and the other one color j. Do that for all pairs i and j. Um, and that should solve the problem. Yes. All right, so 
And so that gets blobs of size n minus one. So, so what's open? Well, um, there is still this log term. And I would say that um, an open problem that's at least worth working on is getting rid of the log term in the case where uh, phi is where the exponent is known. Uh, again, you can't use probabilistic methods. And the problem is we don't even know very much about the extremal values, again, except in the case of C4, C6, and C10. Um, if we have a T-edge tree, again, we, we have these um, bounds. Um, the lower bound depends on the extremal number, so it can be improved with um, Erdős-Sósh. And um, the upper bound depends on Ramsey numbers of trees. And then, of course, in the annoying case um, of the star on T edges, then um, we, we haven't quite resolved it, but we think that can be done. So. And then, of course, you can, you can consider other splits. Um, the splits have been used for planarity and bar visibility. Maybe you can uh, apply another problem other than Turan type problems. And then, of course, you can ask about splits and other combinatorial structures. In hypergraphs, they make some sense. Um, but uh, again, we know even less about hypergraphs than we know about graphs. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Let's have everybody thank our speaker. Thank you. I mean, I have other pictures of Karlsruhe. That's the math building. And that's the Schloss. That is the, the castle in Karlsruhe, which is the, if you look at a map of Karlsruhe, it defines the whole city. And that's looking away from the Schloss at night. And that is something I saw on the streets of the town. <laughs> It didn't strike me as a very rich town, but uh, a pink uh, Lamborghini is pretty impressive. And uh, yeah, I saw that in the supermarket and uh, I don't know, and what do I have else? Oh yeah, uh, dog parking and uh, luft balloons. And then that's just me thinking. And that's in the math department building. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, why don't uh, why don't we open it up for any questions for our speaker? So there, of course, like there are these various strengthenings of Janssen under various. You know, if you know something more about the events, like they're negatively dependent or whatever, and so I'm like yeah. racking my brain to what the yeah. Audience. So so all of them involved another parameter with a lowercase delta, it, yeah. not minimum degree, but something else. And we just said, why calculate this other thing? Because we were always going to lose a log term anyway. So everything just any sort of improvement got absorbed. But yeah, there's. Uh, I think it's positive dependency, but I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe it is negative dependency, but there are a variety of these uh, that are due to Janssen. And, and it's very nice. I mean, there's many, many times you run across a problem like this and you want to solve it using, it's say, let's solve it using the local lemma. And the local lemma doesn't work because there's too much dependency. But in this case, we could, we could get control over the dependency when they were dependent. So. Um, so we took advantage of that and I, I've actually, I've been looking to apply Swen's inequality for a long time. I thought this is beautiful. Why, why have we never used this or have I never used it before? And, um, you know, finally this was a nice opportunity to do it. And I think in general, you just can't get rid of that log term because the, uh, extremal graphs are just such a black box. Um, unless you could do something like Erdős Shumanovich and say not only is the max degree under control, but 
other things are under control in the sense that it's sort of regular in some sense, then maybe you could get rid of that long term. But even then, I think you're just reducing the exponent. Is there a believed truth for the, the fn t function when t is a tree? Um, well, uh, so I would say this is, there hasn't been uh, extensive study on this. So let me say that uh, I believe that neither the upper nor lower bound is correct, that asymptotically it should be n over t, n over t, or n minus one over t minus one plus little o of n. For any fixed t, so I think it, I think uh, so. Uh, the obvious thing to say is well, um, the uh, Erdős-Sósh bound gets rid of the two on the left hand side, and probably you get rid of the two on the right hand side. Um, but that that involves some knowing some Ramsey numbers, and uh, unfortunately, I think those are well known for trees. But thank you. Yeah. Uh, Professor, may I know, uh, would it be helpful to do any kind of uh, alteration there? So if we, the probabilist method, if we don't guarantee uh, every two blob has an edge, but then uh, we can come back and fix it later. Oh, um, so yeah, so I think the thinking that you have here is that you guarantee that many pairs of blobs have an edge between them, but not yeah. all of them. Yeah, yeah. Sacrifice the log. And then what you do is then you try to put them back in. And then, and then make sure without, without creating a copy of H. Yes, that would be the problem because you can't, I wouldn't know how to put them back in. I would try to do the other way around, but yeah, I mean, the, the random partitioning is gonna make some things very opaque for you. And because the graph that we start with is something close to an extremal graph, and then we manipulate it randomly, we don't know what we started with. So we can't really make a lot of good statements about what we end up with. So uh, that's yeah. the, the new inferences we add don't even have to interact with the with the already with the existing graph, right? We can just create a whole new. Yeah. So so what you would your sacrifice would be as follows. So your your blobs are now of size um, constant times whatever, and then you add that amount. So uh -huh. that would mean that you would have to make sure that you're adding a small number and you're maybe adding a perfect matching or something so that you guarantee that you have no interaction. Um, yeah, it, it has to depend on what, what the edge is to, to avoid it. Well, not necessarily. So you can add new vertices. So uh, I think what you're saying, what, what one approach of what you could be saying is, Suppose you wanted to create uh, blobs now of size k over two. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but you're going to run into the problem where many blobs have no edge between them. And what you do is augment every blob and then put edges as you need them, but you make them brand new edges. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, the only thing I would fear there is that you're reducing it to the same problem because in order to insert them, they're going, you're not going to be able to put, you have to create these new blobs, these new sub blobs, and then they have to be H free and you have to put the edges in so that they're H free and where they're missing. And that may be difficult because they, those edges are gonna to have to interact in some way. And so you're gonna to have to know how to put them in in such a careful way so that you can you can avoid creating an edge. Um, it, it's possible that, that that's a good, that I, it's not something I thought of and that's, um, you, you might get a good result there. 
but what I would be worried about is that you're you're creating the same problem and trying to resolve it too. Um, so I don't know. Okay. That's a great approach though. I like that. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Do we have any other questions for our speaker? Okay, in that case, thanks a lot, Ryan. And uh, thanks everybody for coming.